Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition or episode of the Hare Krishna Project Podcast. This is episode number 85. Uh, a big number. A big thank you to everyone who continues to tune in now from all over the world uh, to listen to, to find out what our guest has to say. We're passionate about uh, inviting guests onto this podcast to share their story. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, please do hit that all important subscribe button uh, so you keep updated about future podcasts and video updates from the Hare Krishna Project. And also, if you're follow, if you're watching this on Facebook, please also like or love the Hare Krishna Project Facebook page. So you're also updated about future podcasts and future video uh, productions um, in the future. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our guest this week, guest number 85, Jvala Mukhi. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hello, everyone. Please accept my most humble obeisances and all glory to, to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Jai, Srila Prabhupada. It, it's wonderful to have you with us. We managed to find a time uh, which suited both because you're in the United States. Um, um, uh, in beautiful Florida, I understand. Whenever I think of Florida, I always think of very hot weather. Uh, we're going for a bit of a cold snap in the UK. Um, okay, let's get started with the first question. Um, tell us a bit about you and where you're from. Okay, so um, <laughs> you've seen that meme with a star in the sky, and it says a picture of me a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if you ask who am I, you know, about myself, I have, uh, we could start with, I'm a soul from the spiritual world. I've been here forever and here I am now and going through the whole story. Or we could start with the beginning of this body. But uh, this body began in uh, Detroit, Michigan. My parents were both initiated disciples of his divine grace, Shiva Prabhupada. They joined in the 70s and I was born to them. I am one of four children and I grew up in the Hare Krishna movement in ISKCON uh, primarily in Detroit, Michigan, and in Gita Nagari, and in Los Angeles. We traveled around to those temples kind of back and forth. And then after some time, we moved out to my grandparents' house, and I attended uh, junior high, high school, and some middle school there. And then, let's see, graduated high school, went to Europe, went to North, North Sweden, Lilia learned Swedish and joined the temple again when I was 18. I had been away from devotee association for about eight years while living in Ohio. Mm. And um, a lot of things had happened. Fast forward story. I felt like I became a born again, Hare Krishna. And um, all the, sometimes when you go to a temple and you see Hindu people come in and they stand in front of the altar and they just kind of go, and you can tell they don't really know what they're doing but they're just like nodding their head out of respect because that's what they know. Um, <laughs> I felt like that with uh, growing up in the Hare Krishna movement, like you you have the impressions of, of devotional service, you know, you, you, you the smells and the sounds and the, and the sights and, and the prasadam, but you don't actually understand the philosophy until you take it up yourself and make a commitment to it. So when I became serious about my spiritual life, um, I left to the pro. I was with a, an exchange student program at age 18 in Sweden, and I went to an after-school program with um, some devotees who were visiting there. Um, and it was game over for me. I totally fell back in love with Krishna, and had a, a revolution in my life. I blew off my college scholarship. I had my Family was waiting for me to go back to college. You know, I was going to have a year abroad and go back to college. But um, the Lord, you know, he works in mysterious ways. And so when I was in Sweden, it was like a crash course of why I hated the material world and all, <laughs> all the good things, all the bad things. And um, then he put devotees in my life. And then I ended up with a very kind uh, temple president who was like a father to me, uh, Mani Dar Prabhu, if you're listening. Hi, Kish, I love you. And his wife, Mitravinda, they were very instrumental for me um, coming back into devotional service. So that began a whirlwind of surrender. And uh, I went out on book distribution. And there was a very active preaching center in Stockholm that was right on the corner of a bus station and uh, tram. 
station. We had about 400 guests a day serving prasadam all day long and um, did traveling Sankirtan around Scandinavia and went somewhat to Germany and like that. And um, then in 1998, well, I was, I was initiated in 96 by Hari Kesh Prabhu. And then when he had uh, some hiccups, some trouble, I was remember putting my, my head at the feet of Srila Prabhupada and just being so grateful that I had no position because when you have position, Maya comes and tests very hard. I was very grateful to be a nobody and keep my head down and keep practicing my devotional service. So in 1998, um, I, um, I went for a visit back to the U.S. My, my mother had moved back to the Detroit Temple area and uh, I was going to stay there and just say, you know, I actually called up my friends in, in Stockholm and said, thank you for everything. I love all you guys. And, um, you know, this is when the whole Yatra was kind of falling apart because of, you know, Hari Kesh leaving. And I thought, well, you know, I was born and raised with Shishi Radha Kunj Bihari, who are my Ishta Devs in Detroit, and they're more present than anybody ever. So I was, I was like, hey, I can go to Mangalarti all by myself. I have this whole mansion to myself, the Fisher Mansion. <laughs> You know, I, I can do devotional service and um, I'm satisfied. But um, I was called back to to come come back and I felt I needed to commit to my obligations. So I went back. Little did I know that the reason that I had uh, been called back was because there was um, a young man who had fallen in love with me. <laughs> and uh, so this was asked, back to Sweden you went? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I had a bit of a love story there. And um, my my husband had recognized me as his wife through a video that I had made. <laughs> and so he'd confided in my friends, oh, but but I had left already and he didn't see me and I didn't see him. So they, they conspired and got me back. <laughs> and then uh, there was a bit of a dance there. I was like, mm. and then uh, the first half an hour we talked, we got engaged and it's been 23 years. So <laughs> 23 years and five kids later. So we had a lot of traveling and um, I'm very, very grateful to him for his support. So that leads into, um, I've always been around devotees. Um, I'm very, very passionate about spreading Krishna consciousness because what is Krishna consciousness? It's who you are. It's like people say, are you a devotee? I'm like, well, who isn't a devotee? Some people know it and some people don't, right? Everybody is a devotee of Krishna because we're his parts and parcels. So what Shiloh Prophet came to give us, like when, when they asked him, Swamiji, you know, there are so many churches. Why have you come here to, to change our religion? He said, no, no, I haven't come here to change your religion, but to remind you what you have forgotten, which is God, right? So in the name of religion, there's so much irreligiosity going on. So um, I really learned deep devotion and gratitude to Shiloh Prabhupada from my mother who's a you know, very, very staunch disciple of Srila Prabhupada. And um, if many of the viewers uh, know the little Vaishnava songs, so she's a singer, a songwriter, and uh, my whole generation grew up. She, she wrote children's songs and they got bootlegged and sent around the world. And <laughs> I tell that story in one of my J files, but um, so I inherited that passion, like, you know, any, any kind person wants to alleviate the suffering of, other people right mm. Mm. and we know that ultimately all suffering comes uh, it's a spiritual disease so in order to help humanity and change the world we have to give them what Shiloh Prabhupada gave us but first we have to receive it properly so that's been my focus in my life and in my marriage and I continued my service to uh, in, in that extent you know I got married had kids I was always involved in temple services and usually I'm a singer, so I would do kirtan, do you know yoga pro programs, and I used to take school classes and teach them. And you know, at one point when I was living in Sweden, I was um, I had taught myself Swedish, and I was able to give classes to students in that language, and it was very satisfying to me. That's you know what keeps me up at night is um, you know philosophical debates in my head, like mm. oh, I, how do you defeat this misconception and that misconception? So that's that's my passion. So I hope that. That's a little. Can you can you tell us a bit about what it was like growing up in the Hare Krishna movement? Um, um, what were your experiences as, as a child? Well, my earliest my earliest experiences um, were uh, very magical in a sense because uh, you know in the early days 
everyone was expected to go to the full morning program and evening program. It was very much a community. Like before people had their own homes, they lived actually in the temple. So we didn't have our own beds, our own rooms. It was a very communal experience. And that wasn't, we didn't have any of those things till later, but it wasn't any kind of problem or deficit. We always had children sleeping, you know, like on the floor and, you know, lined up and, I have very positive experiences um, of waking up on one of those, you know, those little mats they have for the temple room floors, you know? So in the Detroit temple, my, some of my earliest memories are of um, uh, the drawer opening up at Mongol Arctic time, you know, 3.50 a.m. And my mom, you know, in our fuzzy footed jammies, you know, slinging me over the shoulder, one kid here, one kid there, trudging four blocks to the temple, you know, and <laughs> putting me on one of those little mats, you know, because of course I'd go go back to sleep and then being part of you know the morning program the mangalarti the japa you know during during class we would be making beads you know little necklaces for the the chota little radha and krishna deities and doing activities and my mom was a lot involved with teaching the children so in the early early years it was very magical we and we um you know the fountains with the lights and the festivals and the bartnatyam and it was like a festival every day, a very transcendental and beautiful experience. And then my connection with uh, Lord Jagannath on the altar, very palpable, beautiful relationships. And then, you know, when we moved around to the different temples, you know, the cows in Gita Nagari and the farm and the yogurt and the milk, and it was wonderful. And then um, there were also other sides, you know, as a child, you're not really aware of politics, but you're aware of your parents' reactions to things, you know? So um, I I could tell there was tension because my, my father would get all angry about stuff and my mom would get upset and, you know, you don't really know what's going on. But um, so around the early 80s, things just didn't go well. And so we, we left uh, Gita Nagri and moved back to Ohio, but it wasn't until... Um, like I said, I, I, I spent the first, what was it, first, you know, 10-ish years growing up in the temples, you know, living that life, and then the next, you know, whatever, seven, eight years in secular society, and we would visit the temples, but it was, the, the closest temple was um, West Virginia near Vrindavan, and we would only go occasionally for festivals, so I had very much a, a mixed experience of you know, it was very strange starting public mm. school. You know, my, my birth name is Janavi. So, you know, when the teacher is giving roll call, they're like, they leave, <laughs> and then they stop at your name and you just like, I'm here, you know, and um, trying to figure out where you fit, you know, in society. And, you know, is it embarrassing to be a devotee? Are you proud of being a devotee like that? And um, does that answer your question? It does. Yeah, it does. Um, and just out of interest, um, why why didn't you go to kind of a guru call? Why did your parents decide to send you to a kind of secular school? Well, um, we I did go to a guru call in Gita Nagri for some time. Okay. It was a, a girl's ashram there. Um, that was in the fourth and fifth grade. But when we moved away back to be, for financial reasons, there was political and financial reasons, we moved away from there and went back to Ohio where my grandparents lived. And so there wasn't any opportunity for, mm. there wasn't anything close by. So I just went to the, the regular secular school, okay. which was kind of good because there can be weirdness, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, there's weirdness everywhere, but you know, there, there can definitely be weirdness. So it was important for me to get a well-rounded experience. What I tell people is that I had the best of both worlds. It says, one of my favorite verses is from Ishopanishad, is that in order to understand the truth, you have to um, study nations hmm. and transcendence side by side. Hmm. That's hmm. a very, very important point for me. So I, I was genuinely getting transcendental experiences. I was learning about nations and then um, I'd gotten married, had three kids. We, we'd moved to, um, you know, when, when I got married, we moved around a bit and then, uh, we settled here in uh, Florida because they have a nice school for the children. And I wanted <laughs> my children to be able to go and have devotee friends because that was an issue in, uh, Washington DC area. It was just 
too expensive and too far apart. So we wanted a closer knit community. And I, I swore I'd never move to Florida because I was like, oh my gosh, there's so many devotees here already. And we have to preach in the areas where there's no devotees. But ultimately, you know, you have to raise your kids with other devotee kids. Otherwise they just, they don't have that association. So we moved down here and it was a bit of a rough landing. But but when I got here, and, and I go through this story in my J files. So when I got here, I was just, you know, doing the mom thing, doing the school thing, going on with my life. And, but then, you know, you're around devotees and then you're like, this isn't transcendental. <laughs> this doesn't have the flavor that I remember of Shiller Prabhupada's aroma on it. Because I remember when I was a child, the ecstasy, I mean, literally the ecstasy, the joy, the, the exuberation of, of kirtan, you know, that mm -hmm. magic you walk in, it's like, hi, ball, you know, <laughs> it's just you could feel it. And um, there was like a covering, a blanket. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but it just didn't feel right. And a lot of devotees had said, you know, this doesn't feel like the same movement I joined. Something was different, but nobody could really put their finger on it. You know, you could point at this or point at that. So anyways, I, um, a main part of my story is that uh, I had tried to help some couple that had just gone through some nasty divorce. And I was seeing affairs and scandals and neglect and um, just lackluster devotional service. It was more like form. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't movement. It wasn't mission. It was. It was you know temple service and you come and you give donation and somebody sits there and pontificates. You know, <laughs> it wasn't. It, it wasn't something that was going to change the world. <laughs> It was some comfortable people doing what yeah. they did. You know, you know, you're, you're smiling because you know what I'm talking about. I, I've seen that in the in the UK. I mean, that's my most of my 99% of my experiences of the Hare Krishna movement have been in the UK, and I've seen that myself. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Right, um, right. Can we talk a bit about? Um, kind of change I guess change the, the track that we're on a bit now um uh, it sounds a bit freaky but I've known of your existence for a for a long time uh you've been very active on social media you've got your YouTube channel uh you do things online and you have done for some time and I mean it's 2023 now many many years ago it must be almost nine years ago I watched the what is now the infamous documentary called the cost of silence uh it must have been nine years ago 2014 um and you were part of that you took part in that um you were interviewed for the documentary can we talk a bit about that in terms of um why were you involved um and why did you feel it was important for you to share your story hello We seem to have lost Valamuki a moment. Um, let's just wait. Uh, this happens every now and then. Uh, we've done 85 podcasts. Um, and this has happened about four times when the guest just absolutely disappears. Um, I know that, that her internet connection uh, wasn't that great today. Um, she was using her phone. Um so we'll just wait a few moments. A big thank you to everyone who's tuning in um, from all over the world. Uh, there we go. There we go. It froze. I don't know what happened. Don't worry about it. You know, I, I was just saying when you were kind of, you kind of left the room uh, that after over 85 episodes, that's happened about four times. And it only happens when I, I start to ask a certain question that, you, oh my goodness, it's that type of question. You know, there was one well, podcast there's, there's I did. There's a reason for that. Yeah, no, I did no, a podcast. There's a reason for that. I did a podcast on this very topic about a year ago. And whenever I mention a certain guru's name, um, the podcast just went dead. It was like really weird, a bit freaky. I'm not going to mention his name today, not not unless you bring it up. Um, it, it, it's not. It, yeah. OK, did you hear any part of my question? We were talking about the cost of silence documentary. But there's still. Hello. Am I here? Let me just. Um... Uh, you're, there's an issue with the podcast. I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to freeze my picture. Uh, there's a. Can you hear me? 
Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to stop my video. There's obviously an issue with 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 bandwidth. Sometimes this happened. It's uh this we I found once before this helped. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? I can okay? hear you fine. Fab. Okay, that's all that's important. Yes, I can hear you. OK, so hopefully I'll come back in the room in a minute and put the camera on. Because we were talking about the. I was asking a question about the 2014 documentary, The Cost of Silence. Um, you were involved with that. Um, tell us a bit about why you were involved and why you thought why you thought it was important to share your story. So where I left off with telling you a little bit about me was when we moved down here to Alachua and I was seeing what was going on with this con, I. I felt very uh, discouraged and disappointed and frustrated. And I knew that there was something more that needed to be done, something needed to be changed, that this was supposed to be a revolutionary movement to, to uplift the world. And this was the 10,000 year golden age and I just didn't see it happening within ISKCON. I'm like, what is going on here? So, and, and so, so many social problems and fall downs and you know spiritual lacklusterness and, you know, deviations, all these things were going on. So, and I had tried so many ways in people's personal lives to affect some change, but I wasn't effective. And I was barely making it myself, you know, very challenged in many ways. So what I did was out of my passion, I went in front of the deities here, Shishi Radha Shama Sundar, and I said a very, very sincere, purify me prayer. And um, I just start, said, my dear Lord, Please allow me to see myself as I truly am so that one day I will be able to see you as you truly are. Please purify me so that I can be a useful instrument in Srila Prabhupada's mission in his hands so that I can be your instrument and do it quick so that I won't be old. I will have some youthful energy hmm. to continue his purpose. And this was a really important turning point for me in my life. This was, I said this purify me prayer in 2010. And then I paid my obeisances and I walked out of the temple room. And I felt a very, very palpable, almost like a tap on my shoulder, like come back in. So that hadn't happened to me before, but I, I could feel Krishna calling me back in. So I turned around and I walked back in and I just folded my hands and I said, yes. And he's, you know, looking at me like he does, you know, that smile, yeah. I don't know what it means. And he says, really? And I was like, uh-oh. Okay. And I repeated the same prayer. Yes, my dear Lord, please purify me of everything, all this, all the anartas, all the unwanted things in my heart. Make me useful. Make me your instrument. I, I, I want to carry forth this mission that Shiloh Prabhupada gave us. You know, the whole world is needing it so much. Please purify me. And then I offered my obeisances and I walked out. And again, I felt the same sensation come back in. I had left the temple room, I turned around and I came back in and I stood there. And this time I knew he meant business. And I was, I was honestly nervous. I was a little scared. And he just looked at me, really, is that what you want? And I knew that something was going to happen if I said yes, but there wasn't any going back. There wasn't any going back. So I said, yes, for all I was worth. <laughs> and I offered full obeisance. And that's what happened. <laughs> a few days after that, my son fell backwards out of a window. Not a, oh. not a high window. But okay. it, was enough. it was enough that uh, I had to take him to, to a, um, a body worker to help because he, he couldn't walk right. He was like five or six years old by then. And... Um, through that connection and he healed fine he's okay but through that connection uh she did uh it's, it's called cranial sacral work and I, I speak about all of this in my j files and my story it's a very integral part of my story but long story short she introduced me to um the conversations that the body holds you know like all of the impressions from all of the lifetimes are what this current vehicle this body of material elements is made of we look the way we look, we sound the way we sound, we have the experiences that we have because of desires and choices and reactions from previous um, bodies. And of course, in this body, this current body, the all of the experiences are stored in the cellular memory of the body. 
So when she did her uh, healing workshop, which I had taken to learn the work, I had um, a very, very life-changing experience in as much as when she adjusted my spine, my lower back, I had a complete past life recall instantaneously, like spontaneously come out with full volume, full color, full understanding of what had happened. And it went on and on and on for, th uh, for about th the workshop was a four day workshop. So every time I went back in, it, it just, anybody would put their hand on me. It would just, it was like pause, play, pause, play, and all the emotions, all of it. And I walked around for three or four days looking at my husband and my children and myself in the mirror, like a stranger, like somebody with amnesia that I had just been dropped into somebody else's body because I was so much in the experience of the previous lifetime. And so that was very, very disorienting, but important because the Lord showed me that uh, suicide is futile. That's how my previous body ended. Mm. And that was a very important lesson because what was to come would challenge me to the point where I would not been I would not have been able to continue my life had I not had a very uh, tangible, visceral understanding that suicide doesn't help. It just makes things worse, if, you know, if it can get worse. Yeah, yeah. And um, and postpones the inevitable. You do have to face everything in your life, and it's it's like. <clears throat> Healing is like a, a big wave of something that's coming at you and you can either meet it and get knocked over by it, or you can go underneath it, you know, like that. So the healing process was what opened up for me in 2010. So it began with a past life recall. And then I met about a year later or six months or a year later, I met um, my mentor, uh, Kamra Devi. Uh, Prabhu, who had had a, a long history of her own healing from trauma and learning the healing arts and her whole story you can see on her work of an angel.com how she got into this field she's mm. an initiated disciple of divine grace Shiloh Prabhupada and uh, so we met in in 2010 and I had gone in for health concerns but as we began to work and unpack what was behind the health issues, more and more the Lord in the heart, who's the source of all knowledge and forgetfulness and remembrance, was opening up recall of abuses that were so horrific in nature that they were like sub, 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 subconscious. Mm. And at first it began with recall of sexual abuse you know, standard, if you could call it that, standard sexual abuse, um, which began for me in infancy. Um, the first sexual abuse I experienced was about a month old. And um, and it continued on until through my teenage years till I left the country at age 17. But I had suppressed all of it. And there was a reason for that. It's not just that when something is so traumatic that you suppress it. Uh, it's, it's a safety mechanism of yeah, the body. Yeah. But there was organized mind control um, involved in it. So the perpetrators were professional in their techniques of trauma-based mind control. And um, so when uh, Shana Karishi Prabhu was putting together the cost of silence in 2014, I felt that it was very important to speak up about the, the abuse that I had experienced um, because I had tried to fix the situation. You know, I had been recalling abuse within ISKCON and I, like so many other people thought, oh, well, if we just put it in front of the right authority, they'll fix it. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. That's what you think. Mm. Right. And especially I'm in a female body. And I'm like, okay, you know, <laughs> let me go approach somebody who can do something about this. So that is why I approached um, Radhanath, who I actually had a very um, friendly and personal relationship with. 
because we were living in uh, Washington, D.C., and I was very much a part of uh, Gorvani's uh, singing group. You know, he would come and we would spend hours together and do so many programs. And it was a very um, familiar, intimate relationship. Yeah. And I thought, okay, I'm having all these horrible memories come up. They, they directly impact the mission, the stated mission of ISKCON. You know, the authorities have to be made aware of what this is because, you, you know, you just cannot move forward unless you rectify this. Everything that is done from any preaching efforts, anything at all, is 100% impacted by this information. You, you have to mm -hmm. stop, mm -hmm. fix it, and then move forward. So I wrote, I wrote him a letter. I, it was hand delivered to him by my brother. I never got a response. Um, I, I made a huge endeavor. I, I've told this whole story on one yeah. of my J files. Yeah. I made a huge endeavor to drive, you know, 17 hours to go see him. I told it to him straight. And that's when I realized that I had just approached the mafia boss to complain about the petty thief. <laughs> and I went, Oh, Oh. And so when the, the, the cost of silence came forward, I felt compelled to warn other sincere spiritual seekers or devotees about this uh, Kali's agent amongst mm. us mm. and do it, do it in such a way that they could begin to question themselves. So, and, and you know what? You can believe me or not believe me. That's fine. But ultimately, Krishna knows everyone's heart. He knows mm. what everybody's done. And Srila Prabhupada over and over again talks about speaking to Krishna. So Krishna's on your altar, Krishna's in the temple, Krishna's mm -hmm. in your heart. And you can go to him and you can say, my dear Lord, show me the truth. I'm ready. Everybody gets what they want. Mm -hmm. Everybody always gets what they want. One more time. Everybody gets what they want. If you want the truth, you'll get the truth. If you want partial truth, you'll get partial truth. If you want to be cheated, you will be cheated forever. Krishna reciprocates with your desire. The truth is expensive. It's very, very expensive. That's why most people don't want it. If you approach the absolute truth, you will be absolutely challenged. Mm. <laughs> because all of the things that you think that you know yeah. will come into question. Mm. And I that that was my experience. So, in terms of as 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 well so, as 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 well as Radhanath, um, you approached other authorities in Iskon as well about the abuse that you experienced as a child, and their reaction was the same as his in terms of they actually did nothing and weren't interested. Um, I approached Altar Sangha and Sangha Swami. I spoke with uh, different, there was a group of senior devotees that I spoke with, but it's, it, it became very clear through putting together names and faces and places mm. and what was coming out for me in my recall that there was no point in trying to go through, you know, the child protection office. I had spent, um, some time with Dara Govinda, uh, who had run the Child Protection mm -hmm. Office in Mayapur for some years. And what he told me was completely congruent with my experiences that, you know, they just wanted him there as a figurehead. They didn't really want child protection. Mm -hmm. the, the the cases that were there were just suddenly vanished, right? Yeah. And even Hari Kesh, I reached out to him and I hadn't talked to him, I hadn't talked to him in years. And I didn't even know if he remembered me because he'd had a mental breakdown. But I called him up to tell him just very briefly, you know, what was going on, which was kind of a strange experience. But um, he said something very interesting was that he had his mental breakdown when he tried to clean up Mayapur and kick the pedophiles out. Wow. And then he had a, a major, major breakdown and and left everything, you know? So that to me is a little too 
um, suspicious. Mm. And when I put the names together with the faces and the places, I understand that you you cannot change the deviation the enforced deviation within the organization because it's become like a blue cheese mm. you cannot take out the blue mold from the cheese it is mm. one continuous thing so at first i thought oh if i just you know speak to the right person we can turn this around and we can purify now keep in mind iskan is my family i know everybody everybody knows me i have my whole life is ISKCON. Yeah. You know, it didn't come easily to me. Like somebody who's joined the organization then can leave the organization. But I never joined the organization. This was mm. my life. These were my mm. fa family and friends. So I was even more heartbroken and betrayed when I went to trusted people, you know, who, who knew me and growing up. And then I said, hey, this has happened. This happened. And I was shut down. I was questioned. I was shut down. I was interrogated. And I was in a very, very sensitive space. You don't, you don't interrogate somebody like, you know, who's just come out of being raped. And that's what it feels like when you have um, spontaneous recall of body memory. The body memory is stored in, and it's like it, it happened real time. So I'm, I'm reliving these events and I'm not in a space to try to argue and prove it, you know? And I, and I think to myself, Oh, you, but you have no proof. I made a whole series called, but you have no proof. I'm like, what did they expect that I was going to, you know, have some DNA samples from fighting off the, mm. the uh, perpetrators stuck under my fingernails for 30 years. Mm. I mean, like, what do you mm. mean? I don't have any look at the train train wreck of my life. Mm. There's there's symptoms, but you don't really want proof. You just want to shut me down. You're yeah. actually not interested in hearing what you say. You just want to shut me down. And if you want to shut me down, why? What's your motive? Mm. Why, you know, Shila Prabhupada was here, like um, Kishori Mataji. I don't know if you are familiar with her, but I watched her interview and I just cried. I just cried. It's so powerful. Maybe you should interview her too. Mm. <laughs> Very powerful. I, I've seen some of uh, quite a few of your videos online and I find them really um, inspiring, uh, sad at times. Um, there's one particular thing, quite a few things stand out for me. One one particular thing that you mentioned in one of the one of the films, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was the Cost of Silence documentary. You and, and we don't have to talk about this if you don't want to, but you talked about experiencing, I think, satanic ritual abuse in Iskon. Um, yeah. I guess my question is, tell us a bit about that if you feel comfortable. Um, um, because you're not the first person that's mentioned that to me. Uh, I've I've interviewed at least some of you will remember Palika, who was guest number my guest number sixty. This is guest number eighty five. Twenty five episodes ago, I, I I interviewed Palika at length from Australia, and she also talked about satanic ritual abuse in Iskon. And I think you've also alluded to that you also have unfortunately experienced that as well. Yeah, so when you when you go through your healing, you begin by remembering the easy stuff, like I said, the sexual abuse. But then as you go deeper and deeper into it, the repressed, the trauma-based uh, mind control starts to wear off and um, start remembering what happened. And uh, so I, I do a blow-by-blow -blow breakdown of how the recall started for me. But you're asking me about the satanic ritual abuse within ISKCON. So I think maybe the best way to answer that question is to do what I call my tele telescope out speech. So here goes. Okay, uh, excellent. Great. So there's creation. Mm. The created beings are demons, right? Mm. <laughs> After mm. Lord Brahma, right? because the souls who leave the spiritual eternal realm are envious of God and they need a realm to be in. So that's here in the material world. We're in Kali Yuga. So the most envious are left over because they didn't go back to the eternal realms in the other yugas, the, the previous yuga. So the, the dregs are left here. The flunkers are left here. Mm. And the deity of this age is Kali or the, you know, energy of the Lord who's in charge of degradation of the soul. And it's sort of like 
if you want to get somebody to stop smoking, you give them two packs of cigarettes and say, smoke them all. Let's do it. <laughs> so that's what Kali's job is. He's not, he's not evil in that sense, but his, his service is to perpetuate, you know, to engage the souls in evil. You know, he is, he knows that he's a servant of Krishna, but that's his thankless task is to degrade till the soul says enough. I mm. want to go the other way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so people, ref I, I never, you know, didn't grow up with the concept of Satan in, in Krishna consciousness. It wasn't there, although Srila Prabhupada does mention the word in his books. And he says, you know, there are many who decry the, the current situation in the world as satanic but they can't do anything about it. They don't know what to do, but we do. So that's what I'm really passionate about because the whole world is run by a satanic cabal. And even three years ago before the pandemic, I, when I, when I went into my recall, I couldn't tell enough people I would be in the grocery store. I'd be like, Hey, did you know there's satanic ritual abuse? Cause I wanted the truth to be known. I wanted to stand from the rooftops and mountains and shout you sheeple people, you are being, led along by man eaters and your children are disappearing and you're eating foods that are injected with human fetuses and you're listening to music that is uh, got the devil's interval in it, the, the frequencies, like every single aspect, the news that we hear, they're all owned by a small handful of elite. So when I would go and try to tell people because they were so conditioned and covered, I was the crazy one, right? I don't want to hear it. You're a blah, blah, mm. blah. Mm. But now Krishna has made an arrangement for more and more people to wake up and understand, oh my gosh, we can't trust the media. <clears throat> we can't trust our politicians. You know, these, you know, these things, which I can't say, you know, are killing people. Um, it's genocide. It's, it's purposeful. And there's an intelligence behind it. It's a plot. AI. What is this? It's, 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 um, a technological body for a subtle being it's a demon you know like all of these things are you cannot fathom evil unless you've lived through it like the the, the regular human mind just recoils it cannot understand it cannot fathom or accept the level of evil that that literally runs this world but i know it because i've lived it i breathed it i've i i mean krishna has shown me the belly of the beast not just mm -hmm. in this life but in others and so i have a very very intimate understanding of what is evil and so here here we go uh, let's fast forward here we are in kali yuga lord chaitanya has been 500 mm -hmm. years ago and abai charan chila Prabhupada, kijai comes to the west and it's it's after world war ii the trauma-based mind control nazi scientist people were imported from europe afterwards to infiltrate America, the United States, and completely collapse the freedom under God, which the whole country was established on. And they were gonna do it through subversive culture. They mm. didn't need to do it overtly with weapons. All the world wars to date, all the conflicts have been contrived. They, they did not come about naturally. The leaders that are, are in place are puppets. There are very few independent leaders. They are all puppets. And who are they puppets of? Srila Prabhupada speaks about this. There are four ruling uh, Rakshasa. Rakshasa means man-eater, mm -hmm. shape-shifting man-eater. There are 400,000 humanoids, you know, 8,400,000 species of life, of which 400,000 are human-ish. Mm -hmm. So we're one kind of human, right? The, the kind that are supposed to use their their beingness to go back home back to godhead but there are other kind of humanoids who are more envious um so they're more covered and they live in different regions according to their karma and their choices <clears throat> but as usual demons are always trying to take what is not theirs because they believe it is owed to them because they are god their philosophy is I am God, I have conquered so much. We read about this in the 16th chapter and so much more will I conquer and so blah, blah, blah. So here they are, they're subverting American culture. They, you know, the, the entire 60s movement uh, was contrived. It was uh, the brainchild of the man-eating cabal. And what did they wanna do? They wanted to break down the family unit. They wanted to introduce um, free sex in the name of love. 
uh, they, they introduced the drug culture and, and most of the songs that are so famous as the 60s woohoo mm -hmm. were written by, um, again, they tend to in the Tavistock Institute. You can reach, research all of this. This is all in the realm of relative truth if you want to research your history. Mm. Um, and so more and more people are becoming aware of how contrived it was, but ultimately the demon's goal is always to destroy everything good and godly. And best if you can do it in the guise of a godly person so that the innocent people follow you, right? So here comes Srila Prabhupada to the West and he gives absolute truth. And within moments of meeting Srila Prabhupada, the hippie movement that, you know, the demons were so proud of starting, you know, look, ha, 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 they bought it, ha, 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 right? That's, you know, it was the end of, you know, single families at that point, single family homes, you know, mother, father, you know, now, mm. now it's free mm. love and just drug, sex and rock and roll, you know? Yeah, yeah. And with the degradation, as we read in Bhagavad Gita, with the degradation of womanhood um, is the destruction of society with the rise of Barna Shankara, the unwanted children. And of course, they solve that by killing them, right? So all these all, demon culture was established. But when the young people met Srila Prabhupada, all of those ideas that the demons had worked so hard to make stick, and they were pretty successful at it, they just gave up within an instant. And they started chanting Hare Krishna. They gave their life to God. They were austere. They were clean. They were happy. You know, they, they were being purified. So Srila Prabhupada became enemy number one for the demons. And he, they took a very keen interest. Like he said, um, the Hare Krishna movement is of Jewish interest. <laughs> and um, of course people talk about that and they're oh you're anti-semitic no 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 you have to understand your history here if you watch there's there's many many true things coming out now but there's a whole documentary series put together by a woman in the netherlands called the fall of the cabal which is essentially um organized criminality it's the it's the um the plans of the the man-eating man-eaters over the centuries they live longer than us. So their plans, when put in place, they can wait a few hundred years and, and see the result that they're looking for. But we humans, we have shorter lives. So we think, oh, how could it possibly be a plan? You're just making that up. It's just the way it is. It's just natural progression. It's not, it's not. So um, the demons had a very keen interest in destroying the purity of what Srila Prabhupada came to give us because the one thing that de the demons cannot touch is purity. They just mm. don't have, mm. they do not have access to it. It's, it's like they, they are repelled by it. Yeah. Yeah. So they make contracts. They make contracts with the soul to, to sell, to sell. You, you can, you have to sell yourself. You have to agree to, to evil. And then wherever hypocrisy is present, Kali and his agents have permission to reside. I'll say that again. Wherever hypocrisy is present, Kali and his agents have permission to reside. So they made it their business to infiltrate the Hare Krishna movement, don the dress of a devotees, uh, you know, come close to Srila Prabhupada. And as we know, they poisoned him slowly and, and until he left the body. Of course, that's all under Krishna's sanction, but that is as a proven fact. You, you can read the reports. It's all there. Mm -hmm. um, they took over his, the organization. They, they changed the books. They, they changed the culture. You know, 80 to 90% of the Prabhupada disciples left after Srila Prabhupada departed, not because they didn't want to continue the mission, but because it was such a hostile environment because of the parasitic man-eaters inside the organization. And, and no, nobody could conceive of that level of evil. I mean, I also, there was a, a one Mataji, uh, one devotee who left her body a few years ago, who told me, um, you know, I witnessed that there were CIA agents picking, you know, there was a, a devotee who was petitioned, you know, would you be our agent within this organization? You know, it was active government um, infiltration. And if if you look into MK Ultra, the mind control programs, that's what they did. They did their mind control experiments within um, small cults or groups so that if and when any of their cult activity came to light, it could be blamed on the organization and not on the CIA. Mm. 
not on the US government and ultimately not on the cabal, which is, you know, ah, there we are. So um, they have a very systematic way of polluting the purity. And they also, they it's not like they're just, you know, like in those um, Hindi movies, you know, when the demons come and they go, Ooh, mm-hmm. and they pull down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I've seen those. I've seen those. <laughs> Right? It's pretty standard. <laughs> the demons come, they, ooh, they pour down blood and flash on the yagya and on the fire, right? So they needed to destroy the purity of the chanting because the chanting purified and it was going to destroy their many centuries long plan to pull the trigger to take over humanity, which is what they're, they're trying to pull the trigger now with the whole, you know, you know, pandemic and uh, weather events through their satellites and, uh, depopulation agendas and uh you know the digital control and Mm. all of this kind of stuff that's going on um so they needed they really needed to destroy the bearers of purity because Srila Prabhupada said that the demigods would be taking birth as in the third generation Mm. they that the demigods were lined up to take birth in this Hare Krishna movement now any any good kamsa or Putin and knows that you've got to kill them while they're young, right? Mm. Right? Mm. So what did they do? They attacked us at the very beginning of our lives. And best is if you don't kill them, best is if you pervert and twist them so that they lose faith in Srila Prabhupada. They blame Srila Prabhupada, which many do, um, and they go away and they're bitter and they're sore and they call it, a, and they reject it. Or even better than that, no, killing is fine. Yeah, you can go ahead and die. Demon kill devotee child, fine. And that, there's been many cases. Second is you pervert them, you destroy their faith, you know, rape them, you know, all that good stuff. And three, best is if you make them one of you, a pretender. Mm. Right? Mm. Oh, he's a second generation. Look how spiritual he is. But what is he really doing? He's running all of the mo- trauma based mind control and he is chanting with the poison built in like a GMO with all of the contaminants that were injected into. So a standard satanic ritual um, included, they always, you know, there's, should I go into this? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy for you to do so. I'm I'm, I'm not um, turning my video off people... because um, I, I'm still keeping my video off because I want to hear your story. And whenever no, I've talked about fine. this year before, my podcast has gone off completely, but I'm happy for you to share your story. Um, um, I'm I'm sitting here listening very um, attently. So um, the worship of of ghosts and spirits and Satan is religion in the mode of ignorance, mm. and their idea is, um, you know, this is talked about in Bhagavad Gita, and and if you read about it in Bhagavatam, you know, these histories are there. You know, human, human sacrifices, yeah, yeah. It's not anything new not anything new what is astonishing is that people in the modern world in the most degraded time period think that it, oh this doesn't go on anymore but like what do you mean it doesn't go on anymore we're in the kali yuga we're like of course it goes on mm. what do you think happens to all of the missing children mm. you know there's a there's a belly of man eaters to feed you know like they they're prepping everybody as a food source and and they don't just eat the physical body they also eat the fear the consciousness they're they're parasites and they suck life force and energy out of you and so they have a whole subtle science behind this you know there's subtle demons and there's gross demons and then there's both so their rituals um are comprised of summoning entities through doing activities that demonic beings are attracted to which is of course you know rape sexual hellish sexual perversion um there's generally a killing of at least one if not more there's uh about 13 people there there will be, there'll be 12 people and you the 13th if, if there's more than there's 33 they have all of their satanic um numbers and they're very keen on numerology and their spells and all of their materialistic uh mastery of the dark arts, the subtle realm. And they summon entities. Uh, they, they traumatize you to the point where you literally uh, leave your body out of self-preservation. It's called disassociation. And then they summon entities within you to run a quote, a program and you switch and you have an altar. Another personality comes forward or it's a, it's a subtle being an entity 
that is installed in your body. And so in this way, they fracture your consciousness uh, and it's a science and, and it, this, this has been studied very minutely by the government, the demonic governments of the world. And this is a, a real thing that they do. So they were doing this and, you know, I was experiencing recall of um, these horrible, horrible events taking place in the temple room. They would bathe the deities with blood. They would sodomize the Prabhupada Murti. They would um, crack a baby on the, on the altar like a coconut. You'd have to eat their body parts. Um, and then they'd do their, they'd choke you out or give you drugs so that you had no recall of it. And then there would be uh, the women who would put you back together cooing sweet lovely words and convincing you that you were having a bad dream and just you know like this and uh there were other people involved too it wasn't just like the uh the false gurus and leaders in the iskon organization they were very much tied to the world elite that are still pulling the strings these days i won't mention the names but they're all ruling class uh man eaters shape-shifting reptilians and ETs and demonic entities and beings um, hand in hand. So you'd have half of the participants in the ritual being Kali's agents with T-Lock and the other half being so-called dignitaries of this world. And then they'd clean you up and you'd have to attend Mongol Arctic. Uh, so each one of those scenes takes years and years and years to get through. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, the way that it's processed is like when you're downloading a big file and it, you know, it's slow, slow, slow going. So each piece of the, of the event processes through the physical and the emotional body. Uh, and it takes, I mean, at one scene there was, it was in 1978, 79 in Los Angeles, there was a killing one, one, person for each of the four directions before they began their zonal acharya thing and that scene took me four and a half years to process until i was on the other side of it and i've been at this for what is it 13 years so far in my process so i can speak about it fairly matter of factly mm. but previously i could i would fall into pieces and be unable to but now i manage it sort of like epilepsy i can tell you know, when another scene is coming up, you know, and how to deal with it and the healing of it, I can speak about in a minute, but go ahead with your question. I, I guess I have two questions. The first one is um, some of those people or, or, or are any of those people that were involved with the satanic ritual abuse in Iskon when you were a child, I, are they still serving as gurus in Iskon today? 100% okay. baby. Okay, and that leads to my next question. Does the satanic ritual abuse of children still go on in Iskon today? I don't know. I can't see why it would be stopped. Mm. I, I, I don't know. I haven't been to one recently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I can't um, see why it would be stopped. Yeah. You know, it, that's what they do. I don't know how they would abstain how they get their kicks mm. Mm. i know i still deal currently with with uh black magic i've become very adept at the subtle send back of black magic because i know that they very much practice that actually um early on in my process somebody called me who said that they had um gone to mayapur and it was like a known thing that the devotees were practicing tantra on each other mm. you know like one group of his kind of throwing tantra on another one and vice versa so that was like you know the sort of innocent stuff but um I, i'm sure that they're still involved i don't know how they could not be mm. Mm. and and that, and that when people come forward and want to make some change about Iskon, how come nobody's doing anything about it? Well, because it's their religion. <laughs> it's their religion. The Satanists and the guys of Vaishnavas, it's it's a tenant of their religion to rape and eat children. 
or man eaters or rakshasas or nagas or not nagas but you know reptilians mm -hmm. that's what they do so why would they um have interested in actually cleaning it up so and we'll get there but go ahead with whatever mm. question you have you know it's it's just and it's just intriguing i can still hear and see you but whenever i talk about this topic on my podcast you know it's uh, uh there's always camera issues or sound issues it's it's uh very intriguing there, there's a um, reason for that there's a reason for that because um this the the technological world is uh governed by well technologies from the lower planets mm. <clears throat> And there's been plenty of times when I've had critical information, um, I would try to send in an email, you know, around these topics and it wouldn't go through and it wouldn't go through. And both of us would be on the phone going, did you get it yet? No, no, no. And I would literally have to do a clearing, which is, uh, you know, a, I use my my energy body to essentially do an exorcism on the, uh, mm. on the lines, so to speak. Mm. And then the email would go through. So there are subtle beings that govern technology. And that's why I stay away from AI and as much as you can. And other things because it's it's not it's not divine mm, mm. my my kind of my next question you've you've probably answered kind of indirectly already but i'm going to ask the question already um to, sorry as anyway uh, the question is uh so you've been an outspoken voice for many years against uh child abuse uh, the abuse of power and corruption in iscon why is it important to speak out <laughs> it's kind of a no-brainer but it's a question for you anyway <laughs> <laughs> who wants to go back to guidehead mm, mm. who wants to go back to guided you do you want to go back to guided is that why you're in this organization <laughs> do, are you chanting Hare krishna because you want to go back to god or not duh because if you don't <sighs> chanting from the lips of non-devotees should be avoided as mm. much as milk Touched by the lips of a serpent causes poisonous effect. Mm. So again, everybody gets what they want. If you want the truth, you're going to see the truth. If you want to be fooled, you'll stay. Everybody who is remaining within the organization who does not step out at this point, if they're in the illusion that they can change it, they are complicit. Mm. Think gambling match and disrobing of dropity and subsequent Kurukshetra war. Think that. Mm. You are complicit if you remain within the organization because you will not be able to change it from the top because it is like a blue cheese. It is the deviation has permeated everything. Now, when somebody's in the temple and they're performing devotional service, is Krishna not there? I'm not saying that. Of course he's there. He's in your heart. He's reciprocating with you. Hmm. But the structure, the organ, the material organi uh, organization has become a splinter group. It has become a deviation. Hmm. ISKCON is not the organization. Please remember this. Put this into your mind. ISKCON is the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And wherever you are, and wherever there is another sincere soul hearing and chanting, reading Shiller Prabhupada's books, trying mm. to pass out Shiller Prabhupada's original books without the changes. Mm. That is ISKCON. It is not the building that is managed by the man-eaters. It is not. Separate that. Mm. Mm. You are ISKCON, not the organization. Shiller Prabhupada began this, I mean, and, and of course that most infamous change you know um never leave iscon no mm. that was changed he said if it becomes deviated then you can you know i forgot exactly the wording yeah, on it but yeah. you can reform you can go somewhere else but it doesn't mean leave shila Prabhupada. it doesn't mean leave shila Prabhupada's mission it means you personally take accountability you personally imbibe shila Prabhupada's teaching and you personally take the flag just like shila Prabhupada did for his spiritual master he personally took that flag and he planted it in the West with mm. all of his devotional might. Mm. And that is what each and every sincere follower of his divine grace needs to do. We all need to become so fiercely committed and strong in our spiritual practice and wanting to know the truth mm. 
that we can all become empowered gurus and teachers. He, Lord Chaitanya commanded, everyone become guru and teach, deliver your countrymen. Srila Prabhupada said, we need hundreds and thousands of gurus. And it doesn't mean shiksha gurus. It means gurus, people who take accountability for souls coming up out of the uh, ocean of illusion and who are able to find an oasis in your house, in your sangha, in your group. We have our deities here mm -hmm. every week or more than that. We come together. We open Chilla Prabhupada's books. We read together. We, we chant the holy names. We celebrate our own Rath Yatra and we just walk around the corner with our deities. <laughs> we we, we uh, do Janmati, Radhastami. We do all of the temple functions just with our little group, uh, just our little teeny sangha. Mm. And that is the solution for the problem. This movement can spread like wildfire grassroots. Mm. If we take the energy that is being poured into the buildings that are controlled by the man eaters, and I don't mean that figuratively, it is literal. The GBC is run by man eaters. I'm not saying all of them are, but they're complicit if they don't know yet. Mm. When will you wake up? The, the, the reports are there on Srila Prabhupada's poisoning. The reports are there about the child abuse. You are not going to get the mafia to, to reform itself. It, it, it will not. And if mm. you think that your guru is okay, you better go to the altar and you better ask the Lord, show me the truth, and then be prepared for the answer. And I'm not saying... I'm not saying go Ritvik. I'm not saying that because the Ritvik would never have been an issue. It would have never come about if people would have, if the disciples of Srila Prabhupada would have actually followed his instruction. Mm. All, mm. Of you, all of you come together, simply hear and chant, become qualified, become purified, become guru, deliver your countrymen. And that's, that's the instruction for every man, woman, and child. Mm. And Lord Krishna tells in 18th chapter, everyone, everybody has to take sannyas. And that's a state of being, mm, full mm. renunciation, full dependence on the Lord. And by our example, we are expected to follow in the footsteps of the Acharya. This is not a hierarchy, you know, that we, we, we've been trained in, where now when people get initiated, they have to uh, sign an allegiance to the, to the organization. What is mm. this, corporate? Mm. Mm. This is not spiritual life. Right? The product of... ISKCON is the consciousness, right? Isn't that what it says? International Society mm. for Krishna Consciousness, Consciousness. Yeah, absolutely. Like, isn't the isn't the consciousness of the individual practicing devotional service supposed to be our our measurement, mm. our barometer for how successful we are? Mm. Right? And Srila Prabhupada says you can measure how advanced a society is by how happy its cows and its women are. Mm. <laughs> 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 like when I when I went to Mayapur to, to to deliver that speech in front of about a thousand devotees in um was it 2013? Yeah, I, I've seen the video footage of it. Yeah, prayers of transformation. I went to the Bhajan Kutir of Srila Prabhupada and just was in very deep prayer to him. And in my my inner vision, I, I was genuinely surprised because I, I wasn't expecting that kind of response from him. I was just standing with folded hands saying, please, Srila Prabhupada, I want, to, I want to help carry on your mission and I want to purify it. I want to do something about all of this stuff. Mm. What, what should I do? And to my great surprise, um, I don't know if you've ever seen Srila Prabhupada angry, but his lip quivered. Wow. His lip quivered with with. Rage, rage. Mm. If you've ever felt Srila Prabhupada's rage, it's like, and I knew it wasn't at me, but it's still like, oh, I was, I was like, oh, and I could feel his, his hot tears and his lips quivering. And in my, in my inner ears, I was hearing, where are my men? Where are my men? Because it, it, it was like, you, you little girl are coming and asking me this, where are my men? But his mood was like protective, like a grandfather. Like, why are you a young woman having to come and ask me this? Where are the protectors? Where are my men? Why, what have they done? Furious. Mm -hmm. 
furious. So, but what can be done? Mm. What can be done? So I understand that Krishna has a, a plan and he sanctions ultimately everything. Not a blade of grass moves without his sanction. And I know that my role is in spending the rest of my energy in this lifetime to carry forward the second half of Srila Prabhupada's mission, which is Daivi Varnashram. He said only half of what he came here to give was completed and the other half were, were the communities. Because how can you practice devotional service in demon society? Mm, mm. How can you do it when you're, you're being confronted and challenged on every level? We need small groups of like-minded devotees who mm. want pure devotional service or bust. <laughs> we want pure devotional service or bust. We are not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, okay, Srila Prabhupada's gone, no more guru. Let's just chuck them, right? Mm. Let's, or we're not going to go to some other, other uh, devotional lineage. They, they may be very nice, but our heart belongs to Srila Prabhupada. He gave us an order and we will continue it. You know, none of those other Vaishnavas have the same um, obligation of duty to Srila mm. Prabhupada and his lineage. They have their own lineage. They don't have the same mood and the same uh, mission. I mean, maybe the overall is there, but like Srila mm. Prabhupada gave us our, our marching orders. He said, we don't need more devotees now. Boil the milk. So what we do here in our Sangha, by the guidance of our spiritual teacher, our, our you know, there's no words to describe my gratitude to my mentor, my teacher, Kamar Prabhu, is to boil the milk. Every day, our, our devotional service to the Lord is to look at the dirty things in our hearts. Mm. and to heal them and to offer them up to the Lord and say, I give no more power to these belief systems. I'm, I'm done with that. And we come together and we hear and we chant and we continue. And the whole purpose of that is so that we can be a shining example that you can do it too. We mm. don't want everybody to move to Florida and become part of our group. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the world's a big place. Everybody can do this in their own community. And it doesn't have to be through the demon run organization. It's mm. like those cartoons that I made. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the cartoons that I made, but the one of them is a ship. It's a, it's a big cruise liner that says ISKCON on it. And it says whereabouts unknown. So the, uh, if, a, if the helm of a ship is hijacked and taken over, it doesn't mean that the passengers on the ship are bad. It means that they have to make a choice now what to do because mm -hmm. the ship mm -hmm. isn't heading in the same direction that they purchased the ticket for. Mm -hmm. the, the rank and file devotees want to go back home, back to God. They didn't know that man-eating you know, reptilians and satanic cabalists took over the helm. They weren't aware of that. But the symptoms are everywhere. And that's why there's been so many, so many issues. But the, the, the solution for that is so simple. It's like the sky is blue. Yeah. The simple, yeah. It, it, the absolute truth is always simple and clear. The, mm -hmm. the simple thing is to follow Srila Prabhupada's instructions. There are, I would say there are many pure devotees on this planet. Many Prabhupada disciples who have dedicated their lives 100% to his divine grace. And mm -hmm. they are qualified to give spiritual guidance to new people and to, to continue to advance themselves. Nobody's trying to imitate. Well, I shouldn't say that. Those rank and file devotees are not trying to imitate Srila Prabhupada like, like the, the false gurus are. But th they are both advancing together. Mm. But if they're 10 steps ahead of you, they can help you. If there are a thousand steps in front of you, they can help you. Mm. They are qualified to lead you, but they've been They've been purposely crushed by the present IFCON leadership. You aren't qualified. You'll never be qualified. Um, you should just give it up. Go Ritvik. Go go to do some other uh, Godia uh, group. You should um, make it up as you go, as long as you feel good about it. You know, th this kind of thing. But none of those approaches will actually free you all the way from the unwanted things in the heart, which allow us to go back home, back to Godhead. Srila Prabhupada gave us a formula, a very specific formula that when you follow it, automatically 
you can see the result. You, you feel happy, you feel joyful, you feel empowered, you're shiny. And everyone can do this on their own. The books are there. The, the, the devotees are there. Become aware of the poisonous effects and avoid it. Stop mm -hmm. drinking the GMO, you know, sangha, the Mayavadi sangha, the reptilian sangha. It will, it will cause you to start accepting the satanic agenda. There are so many devotees who think, I'm okay, you're okay. Try telling that to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. What would he say? I'm okay, you're okay. Mm. What would he say? <laughs> oh, it, you're asking me the question. I thought it was rhetorical. Yeah. Um, I think you'd be very challenging, actually, in terms of if you're not okay. And these are the reasons why you're not okay. Um, right. Yeah. Right. And and somebody who's on the path back home, back to Godhead, wants to know how they're wrong. Yes. They want, they're, they're looking for correction. Why? Because they know that whatever they believe is keeping them in the cycle of birth and death. Mm. Mm. Right. But it's, it's, there's been such a demonic agenda influence present now that um, even really beautiful, nice devotees have bought into the satanic agenda of mm. equity, of mm. e inclusion, all of these words that sound so good. But what are they really? They're saying, drink the satanic agenda with your milk. Drink the Mayavadi. Drink the dark satanic religion while you're chanting Hare Krishna. Because what is the purpose of the demons? To destroy everything good and godly. And they and because, because you're you think in your goodness that there couldn't even be that level of evil. You think, oh yes, it's all good. Let's invite everybody. No. The the result is that your own bhajan, your own sadhana bhakti, your own in, endeavor to go back home back to Godhead becomes full of hypocrisy. Mm. And then you have to take another birth. So we have to be unsentimentally scrutinizingly looking at self-searching the, the the healing process is synonymous with with the self-realization process we have so many insane crazy ideas from association with matter since time immemorial mm -hmm. and we have to become purified of those misconceptions and how do we become purified by associating with the pure devotee shall Prabhupada's books are right there the 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 the, the rank and file Prabhupada uh, disciples are there. They've had years ahead of you of, re of revelations and realizations. And um, I know, uh, even though Rupanuga Prabhu criticizes us and our group, he told me something once that was very important um, that I would like to share. He said that Tamal had asked Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada, when you leave, um, is it enough to just read your books? Right? Because we hear this a lot from the Ritvik mm. group. And Srila Prabhupada leaned forward, grabbed Tamal by the ear, and bent his ear. And he said, my books cannot do this. <laughs> right? Because when you're reading Srila Prabhupada's books, mm. and, and I'll, I'll give you a practical example of this. Mm. When you're reading, reading Srila Prabhupada's books, everybody looks out of their eyes through their current um modes of material nature they're they're like you have glasses on right so they're clear glasses but imagine they're not clear glasses mm. so you're going to perceive everything according to your lenses right so when you reach Prabhupada's books you're going to pick up what you want it's like a filter and uh, imagine imagine becoming a heart surgeon from reading a, a manual without your residency mm. Would you would you be qualified to perform heart surgery? No, no, no. You you have to have somebody experienced standing over you and saying yes like this, no like yeah. this. We have the same access to the same textbook, but that person has revelation, and that's the way that Krishna set it up. He says, "Evam param param praptam imam rajar shayo vidu." Right? Krishna gives that guru parampara for a reason because it's personalism. It's mm. a person, and ultimately, it's. Uh, uh, Shimati Radharani introducing us to Krishna. That's mm. personalism, right? The the, the the Ritvik understanding is impersonalism. That means I'm going to be my own guru. You know, anyone who has themselves as a guru has a fool for a disciple, right? Mm -hmm. And that principle of surrender of Atmani Vedanam. Now, even if your your uh, a proper disciple that you feel inspired by isn't a hundred percent pure, by your surrendering your free will to them and seeing them as Krishna's representative. That principle of surrender purifies both of you. 
And if you happen to be more advanced than them, you'll take them back home, back to Godhead. But that's the system given by Krishna. And we can't change it just because there were deviations within the organization. And because that's another one of Kali's tricks. You know, false guru, okay, no more guru. And we'll, let's do it in Prabhupada's name, right? That's the best. Mm. So there's an article written by my mentor called uh, Not in My Name. Srila Prabhupada's name needs to be cleared from all of the horrendous things that have gone on in his name, the false things that have gone on in his name, including um, the, the, the splinter reactions to the deviations. If anyone wants to actually follow Srila Prabhupada's instructions, the greatest and hardest instruction is become purified, become a guru, and deliver your countrymen. Mm. And what would that mean to you every day of your life, knowing that there were one, there's one other human being, at least, if not many more, who looks at you mm. as Srila Prabhupada's representative? How would that change the way that you do your life? Right? You would, you would do anything to be a better person because you're doing it out of love for Srila Prabhupada. And I want to encourage every initiated disciple of Srila Prabhupada, please take this up sincerely. Don't think that you need a stamp of approval from the organization. It is not an official position. It is not a, a managerial position. You don't need permission to have a child. It's natural. You become a father when you mature. You make children, right? You go and make disciples. And if you want to, when you go out and you preach to somebody and you give them the shelter of Srila Prabhupada and you want to bring them back and show them the deities, don't bring them to the organization because what are you going to do? You're going to be bringing them to Kamsa and Putana. And they're just going to destroy their spiritual lives, right? Take them. There's many devotees who have tried to make online resources, but I will give the one that we've made um, called purelyprabhupad.com. And this is access to, again, purelyprabhupad.com and purelyprabhupad.org. Purelyprabhupad.com is uh, all of Srila Prabhupada's books and all of his lectures. Um, we'll, uh, I, I will give all of the links to uh, mm, please Narada do. Prabhu here. And so I'll make sure I promote accessing. it with this podcast so they can see and, yeah. and click so, on the links. So that yeah. you, can see, you can have a resource for your in-home temple. The solution to all of the deviations is for you to take personal responsibility for spreading Lord Chaitanya's mission of love as mm. given to us by Srila Prabhupada and doing it in the mood of Srila Prabhupada. We don't need anything other than what he's given us. Find a Srila Prabhupada disciple that inspires you by their, mm. by their endeavors. Take shelter of them. Encourage them. So many of them have been discouraged. Come together. Have feasts. Have programs. And, and deliver the world. Mm. what could be mm. more fun your guaranteed mm. success the golden age is upon us mm. and you know just just to say i i am kind of seeing this now around the uk and i've recently been to france and i've seen it there they're kind of in more independent devotee communities that are that are still under the umbrella of or have uh, under the shelter of Srila Prabhupada, but are just not part of the institution of iscon anymore and it's right. and there's certainly a number of them and they're growing yeah. Uh, and it's really, really nice to see they're independently minded. They're independently thoughtful and they're not waiting for someone to give them permission to do anything. Right. They're just right. getting on with it. Right. But, but that was the whole way that Srila Prabhupada set up in the first yeah. place. He was not supposed to be telling you what to do. They were, they were a managerial thing. Mm. Everybody was supposed to be independently intelligent, mm. independently strong devotionally, mm. No, not like the top down. They, you know, the deviant ISKCON organization has tried to copycat the Catholic Church. You know, and if you went into the basements of the Vatican, you'd be horrified. You'd never come out. You know, <laughs> tell you horror stories. You wouldn't sleep at night. You know, so that's what they're. That's what they've been trying to do to Shila Prabhupada. And you see the minimization of Shila Prabhupada. You know, the the the, the idea. Okay, Shila Prabhupada gave us the basics. Now we'll take it from here, Swamiji. You know. Mm. this nonsense you know oh if Shil Prabhupada was here he would have said something different let me take it in my direction mm. <clears throat> yeah that, that I mean that's certainly what I've seen from Iskon in the UK they're very top down they're very um, authoritarian and they like well, to write letters you, that's because you have you know uh, England is very very um, populated by reptilians look at the royal family 
<laughs> I have heard that one before. <laughs> oh, and, and I, I will go on a limb. I have not named names before in any of my, but I, I will do something special for you. Go on then. <laughs> I have been graced by the presence of the royals in the satanic scenes that I've been in. In terms of the British royal family? Okay. They are not human. I think that in terms of um, child abuse in ISKCON, I think we've only just seen the, the kind of tip of the iceberg. Yeah. You know, in terms of... Uh, I'm not going to say his name, you know, one guru who was recently found, I mean, everyone knew he was abusing children, but it took 40 years for the institution to do anything about it. And I think that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what makes me angry, what makes me frustrated is that, you know, <laughs> there's quite a lot of, there's a number of paedophiles and senior leaders at positions of ISKCON. If you're not a paedophile in ISKCON, you're covering up for other paedophiles in ISKCON. Right. And I think most of the gurus, most of the sannyasis, you know, they've turned so many blind eyes over the last 30, 40, 50 years. Right, but for what? For what? Because they have um, some motivation for some comfort or or mm. they've been made, they've been blackmailed. I mean, I don't know what the, the hazing is to become a guru within ISKCON. It's, it's probably some nasty scene. You know, they just like with any politician in the world, they don't uh, the, the satanic cabal doesn't let them have any position of um, power unless they have dirt on them. So mm. they, they actually make them sleep with children, film it, and then they have something to blackmail them with if they step out of line. That's standard procedure for, um, you know, entertainers or for politicians in the world. So I don't know what their dark <laughs> mm. thing mm. is. And, and maybe, and you know what the sad thing is? They're so expert at what they do. A lot of these devotees probably don't even remember it. You know, I, I have a lot of affection for different ISKCON gurus who are beautiful devotees, but they probably don't even know it. You mm. know, the, the level of mind control, the level of black magic, it literally puts like this over mm. the head. Mm. And I feel like the longer that you've been around it, the, the, the thicker it is. So... At this juncture, I would like to offer my services to anybody who wants to step out of the um, the influences of the, the demonic influences and to put their their bhakti through a filter, <laughs> poison out, pure devotional service in. I have been taught this process. It's not anything different than what you read in Bhagavad Gita, but it's applied through the healing arts. Um, healing is not, you know, transcendental. It's a supportive science, like uh, art and music are to bhakti. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not in and of themselves spiritual sciences, but they're supportive sciences. So the healing um, aspect of it is like sometimes people say, "Oh, well, what kind of work do you do?" Mm -hmm. And um, mostly, I just do cooking, cleaning, and chasing kids. But um, when I do my professional work, I do. Uh, I call, for devotees, I'll explain it like this, assisted anarta nivriti, which is I help with releasing unwanted things in the heart. And it's a skill set that I've acquired through my own healing process and learning it through my mentor. And I do have an intention, and I don't hold me to the time frame on this because things take forever for me, but of, of making like a, a webinar or mm -hmm. a course mm -hmm. that devotees can apply these principles in their own lives and get the same results. Because I went from, utter betrayal, utter spiritual devastation, complete confusion, rage to the point where I couldn't move. I, I was literally petrified with rage. Um, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to kill myself or somebody else. You know, I was like, I went from that state of being to where I am now. And I hope that you can see mm. that I'm, my mentor says, um, there's no words to describe the pain and even less words to describe the joy on the other side. Hmm. Well, you're certainly glowing now. You've got a wonderful smile and you seem very you. happy. You're, you're appearing. Yes. As yes, because the gift of the bottom is the top. Hmm. Hmm. I'll sing you one of my little ditties. I've got an album I intend to produce anytime now. It's taking forever, but the gift of the bottom is the top. <laughs> 
The gift of the bottom is the top. The gift of the bottom is the top, 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 top. The gift of the bottom is the top. Topmost ecstasy, Krishna's lotus feet. This is where we'll meet in our pain and grief. So this gift of the bottom is the top. The gift of the bottom is the top. The gift of the bottom is the top, 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 top. The gift of the bottom is the top. Wonderful. <laughs> Fantastic. Um... I'm conscious that I think you you might have to go soon. Um, we've been chatting for an hour and a half, believe it or not. Oh, uh, wow, really? Yeah. yeah. Well, on this recording we have, you and I have been chatting before that as well. But it, it's been, I've really appreciated uh, you making yourself a, self available to record this podcast. Um, and I've been really, um, I've really appreciated you sharing your story. And I know that your story will hopefully inspire others as well, other people to speak out, other people to come forward. Um, I know I know that there are other vote devotees that have experienced abuse in ISKCON, and it is so important for them to speak out and share their stories. But ultimately, my purpose for coming on your podcast mm -hmm. was to extend the same shelter that I got to everyone else. Srila Prabhupada gave us mm. the ultimate shelter from Maya and from the darkest of evil. And that shelter is available to each and every person. If you want to check out what we're doing, it's, you know, purelyprabhupada.com, purelyprabhupada.org. I have my personal website, jvalamuki.com, mm -hmm. and we'll have all those links down there. If you want to hear the story of uh, my mentor and how she came into her knowingness of all of these things and, mm. and her being able to guide me through this level of darkness. Her story is also available on purelyprabhupada.org. It's her autobiographical series. She has 11 videos up of that. And, um, you know, there's plans for so many more productions, but ultimately I want to see the second generation, the third generation s s defeating all of the demons by letting them out of their hearts. I was given an instruction between lifetimes by the Lord that I meditate on daily. He told me to transmute all of your experiences and hold none of them. Transmute all of your experiences and hold none of them. Mm. Within that one sutra is the entire process of self-realization because we are eternal. Even the reptilians, <laughs> even the demons, they are devotees of Krishna and they've forgotten who they are. Mm. And Lord Chaitanya has come here to invite the most fallen, including them, to take shelter of the holy name. Like when I do exorcisms for people, mm. it's, it's not like there's no fight. They come out with folded hands in gratitude because mm. nobody's ever treated them before with respect because they're part and parcel of Krishna as well. Mm. Devotees are not envious. So evil cannot conceive of the Lord. There's so many misunderstandings because they're constantly immersed in the misconceptions of the body. And therefore they attack the pure devotees who come to preach the Lord's message. Like why did Lord Jesus Christ, why was he crucified? He just came mm. with a message of love to, to everyone, mm. but because they, they can only perceive their envy. So they think, Oh, he wants to be, he's fighting for my position. He's fighting for my power. Let's finish him. Right. Same thing with Srila Prabhupada. Oh, he's, here's some powerful mystic. Let's finish him. Let's take his kill guru, become guru, right? Mm -hmm. But they had no intention of trying to have any position here in the material world. And so we're trying to follow in those footsteps ourselves. We don't care how many followers, we don't care for followers, mm -hmm. but we genuinely are in the mood of Lord Nityananda with compassion saying, my dear spirit soul, isn't it time to give up all of these misconceptions of the temporary body? I mean, demons aren't happy. You know, they go through all of this horrendous trouble and they're miserable, right? You, you, can't, you can't be a blood, blood drinking baby killer and be happy. It just doesn't mm. work because mm. it's not your eternal nature. Mm. So we invite everyone to chant Hare Krishna and be happy. My, my mentor, Kamara Prabhu, she says, that's the hardest instruction Srila Prabhupada ever gave. Mm. He said, chant Hare Krishna dot, 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 and be happy. <laughs> Well, I'm certainly going to share those links that you've mentioned uh, with this podcast, the uh, purelyparalpod.com, purelyparalpod.org, and your own personal website as well. 
um because i want people to see what you're up to to, to feel yeah. inspired and to to set up their own sangha their own kind of a little group in their house in their community yeah, and, and you know i'm i'm here to consult with if yeah. anybody has any questions on on how we've been able to do it ourselves or how to, you know it's like when you when you find out your guru is an xyz what do you do you know like mm. how do you how do you it's weather kind of, that be yeah big shock <laughs> yeah it's like oh my gosh my world just fell apart what do i do mm. Mm. you know so um yeah i'm here for anybody who has questions you know I, i'm not always so quick getting back to everybody because i have a pretty busy schedule but it's my passion. You're a busy person. Yeah. Um, well, um, Devala Moki, it's been, it's been wonderful to have you as guest number 85 uh, on the Hare Krishna Project podcast. I really appreciate you giving up your time um, to, uh, to record this. Uh, and I will make sure that people get to see those links and hopefully people can get in touch with you uh, for advice um, and support and hear about your mentor as well. I have seen uh, at least one of your mentors films and I was also very inspired by it as well. And it was, it was her that, um, recommended that I contact you, uh, which, which I'm pleased that I did. Um, so, uh, uh, um, Thank you to everyone for tuning into this week's podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, do not forget to hit that all important subscribe button so you can hear about future podcasts. And also, if you're watching this on Facebook, please do uh, either like or follow the Hare Krishna Project page uh, so you can keep updated about future podcasts. Uh, so until next week, I'll see you all soon. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Bye.